Hello, Tona. Thank you for joining us at My G Work, the LGBTQ plus business community today. Um, I'm honoured to meet you as you're such a huge inspiration to us all. Um, you've shown the world that despite barriers related to your identity, you can achieve some of your wildest dreams. Uh, we know you're a globally renowned musician, a violinist, mezzo-soprano, I believe, who performs internationally. And you're also the first African-American transgender woman to perform for an American president. So I wondered if you can share some of your main achievements as a transgender woman of colour, um, including your uh, performance for President Obama, which I believe was a lifelong dream. It really was. Um, I, I That is what I'm mostly known for, um, is advocating for the arts, um, transgender people, um, people of color. But I'm mostly known for being the first person um, of trans experience, as we like to call it, to perform for a sitting president. And I have to say it was a dream come true because, as you guys know, um, historically it was the first time we had an African-American president. And so, therefore, everyone wanted to show our support as much as possible. And so to be able to perform for someone um, like Barack Obama just really fit well with how I think about diversity and inclusion and all those things. And so I actually called the people who were organizing the event and said, hey, you know, I don't know if you guys are going to have a big band or fanfare or something for the president, but it was an LGBT leadership conference. And he was the first president to ever attend. He was the first president to ever allow transgender people to come into the White House and to advocate for ourselves. Um, I mean, he just did so many things to try to understand our community that I wanted to make sure that I volunteered my time to showcase that and to point him to other people and say, we need to really support this president. And so I called them and they said they had these huge names, Neil Patrick Harris and all these people. And I see Neil Patrick Harris all the time when I would perform in New York City. I live in the D.C. area. And so I said, well, if you need me, just let me know. So then they wrote me back and said, we actually do. We think it'd be great if you would sing the national anthem. And I thought this was fabulous. So I went to my my stream players and got this incredible arrangement done. And it was supposed to be me <laughs> with my ensemble. And on the way to do it, they called and said that one of the musicians could not be on the same stage as the president because they were institutionalized growing up. So here you here I am having to tell my colleagues that they couldn't be on the stage with me. And another young lady who was going to be part of the trio, her daughter had some kind of mental crises or something. And so it was just all of this. And all this was happening the day or two days before the event. So I ended up having to do it a cappella. <laughs> that was not in the plans. But you just, as a performer, you learn that you just kind of have to go with the flow. And it ended up being just the most amazing thing. The sound people were awesome. They figured out a way to give me a cathedral sound for my voice. And I just got up there and just did what you have to do. Wow, what an experience. What was it like to perform for President Obama? Did you get a chance to speak to him? Absolutely. Now, he, I think while I was actually performing, he was in the back like, meeting and greeting and doing things because you know how it is on these programs so they're very meticulous and it was also a fundraiser so I think that evening we raised like six or seven million dollars and part of the fundraising was you could get a photo with the president for x amount of dollars and um speak to him if you were part of some organizations and whatnot and it was like three levels of security. I mean, we had to take our instruments in, you know, all of that that you would expect from a presidential event. Um, and But I did get a chance to speak to him afterwards and he thanked me 
or performing. And he was just so wonderful. And so I have a lovely picture of me with him. And I was so excited. I actually grabbed him and pulled him close to me <laughs> just because it was just such a wonderful moment. And it sounds like he's um, such a great uh, ally for the community. We didn't even know at the time how much of an ally he would be. Um, if you, I don't know if you guys remember during that period, he was still um, trepidatious, I guess you would say. Just he, he, we didn't know if he was going to be for gay marriage. And it took a long time. And in fact, at that event, he was heckled a little bit by um, protesters who wanted to know what was his stance going to be. It was, a, it was, he, he wasn't, a, we knew he wasn't against it, but when he come right out and stated it, and so he was heckled a little bit. And unfortunately, that, that messed it up for the press that I would have gotten from the event because he was going to go see Hamilton and just all these different things. And so our event, even though we had Audra McDonald, who sang beautifully, we had um, Neil Patrick Harris and other celebrities there. It didn't get the, you know, the attention that it should have. Oh, that's a shame, but it's great to hear that um, regardless, he's, he's a fabulous ally and uh, you had a great time performing for him. You're also a great vocal role model for younger artists, especially LGBTQ plus people um, and people of colour. Um, can you share some of the advocacy work that you're doing to help younger people who are struggling with their identity and be themselves? Absolutely. Well, one of the first things I realized, even with my own training, that there are so many stereotypes about what was possible based off of your gender. You would think, having come from opera and there was so much cross-dressing and everything else in opera and the great castrati and all those things, that it wouldn't be a problem in classical music, maybe in other genres, but not in classical music. But it actually was, and where it would be a problem would be in the audition space, working with different coaches. Um, I remember having one coach say, oh, this goes above an F. You probably can't sing anything over that. Just these sort of mi microaggressions and different things. So one of the things I decided to do was to start my own teaching company called Aida Studios. And I go into the homes of all kinds of clients. And also I teach around the world online. And I teach people to let go of all those things and just to see the voice is the voice, the voice is the voice, period. No matter what the gender, no matter whatever. Um, and the same thing for my instrumentalists. You know, if you're, if the better person happens to be someone who's younger, then I will put them in the front. It, you know, I just, believe in everything being fair and just. And so one of the ways I advocate is by teaching my own my own private studio and going around the country and hopefully one day the world doing master classes and um, clinics and things like that. So I just got back from Massachusetts where I was with the Oyster River um, High School, middle school, and with the University of New Hampshire. And so all that combined, I was there for five days. And I mean, it was a tough schedule. You get up early in the morning and it's like, go here, go here, meeting here, coach here, this is that. And then we did a big performance. And one of the things that I would like to do now is integrate students into my performances more and more. And so uh, that was a grand experiment, as you can imagine. Um, the conductor was very nervous, but she was fabulous. It worked out great. I played meditation from Thais as a solo, but then we played Mozart Divertimenti. We played um, Vivaldi. We played um, Bach, the Bach double for two violins. We did the Vivaldi concerto for four violins in B minor. Things that I could grab some of the students from the orchestra and have them play with me. I feel that that is integral because a lot of times people just ask you to just come and speak or perform at the students. But I was in programs where the, the faculty and I often did performances together, or there would be a side-by-side -side concert with the people from the symphony or the opera company will come in 
And I was also in gifted and talented programs ever since I was in middle school. So I just have a different way of thinking about what a student needs if you want to be a performer, okay? It's a little different than just education majors, um, not to put them down or anything, but it's different when you are gearing yourself for a life of performance. It's a, it's a totally different way of thinking. And it was an a huge success. There wasn't a dry eye. You can see the pictures of me like wiping the tears away to see how hard everyone worked to learn the real repertoire. Nothing was abridged. You don't have to do that, you guys, with young people. I, I, it's just a shame that I see that across the board. They can play real Bach and Vivaldi. You just have to take the time and work with them. It sounds like it's a, it's a rewarding experience for you, but also a rewarding experience for the students that you're working with. What are some of the main challenges that they're facing right now in the U.S.? And how do you advise youth to overcome some of these challenges? The challenges right now are tremendous. It's one of the reasons why GLAD asked me to go to one of the pre-White House Correspondents Dinners so that I could speak with um, some of the news um, hosts of, of, very, of, of various, um, what, what do you will call them, um, various television shows, political shows. Right now, our youth are under attack. In order for one political party to get ahead and to, to cause a lot of fear-mongering, the most dangerous thing about that is that our youth, LGBTQ, are the most vulnerable students. The suicide rates are through the roof, especially for a transgender child. And for them to take this time to make political points um, about our lives and to use misinformation, misinformation, disinformation, is just appalling. So one of the one of the biggest things that we have is for teenagers is whether they can compete, especially if you're a transgender person, if you can compete in the gender that you have transitioned to. Um, so if it was a male to female sort of transition, even in teens, can you compete with cisgender women or girls? So that is one of the biggest debates that is happening. And of course, what the so much misinformation, one of the things that people don't understand is that there are very strict guidelines in order for you to be able to do that, okay? So you're, you've are you been on hormones for quite some time. Um, we see this in like MMA, like all kinds of other sports and arenas. These women have been tested through and through. And hormone... Um, Hormone therapy does a lot of things to your actual body from bone density, all kinds of things. You will notice when you go through the transition of being on hormone therapy that you are weaker than you were before and that you need help and just different things that might not have been the case um, for you. But most people don't know that. Most people haven't gone through this process. And the misinformation that they're saying about the trans youth is really appalling because there is no school that's saying that you can have actual surgeries or anything as a as a as a middle school or high schooler. Like it's just literally not an issue. But because they want to make people believe this is what's happening and that there's no counseling and that, you know, it takes a long time just for them to get approved to get on hormone therapy. So of course, no one is running out and approving surgery. So I, I fear for the youth right now um, that is so unfortunate that they are being targeted like this. But I also feel that more people like myself should be speaking out about it. And what I would tell the youth is that, again, this sounds cliche, but it will get better. Um, everything that they're doing now has been done before. The same arguments that they have, the conservatives have been saying and whatnot have been said time and time again when they didn't have anything else to do 
instead of just minding their own business. And as long as you're not harming children or anything like that, we need to learn how to allow people to be who they are. Because if we allow them to be who they are, they can achieve greatness as I have in my career. So that would be the first thing is to understand that it will get better, to understand that those of us that do care, we are out here advocating, we are out here protesting, we're doing everything we can on your behalf. Our job as adults are to, is to make this world a better place for the future. The future is our youth. And so we just need more people concentrating on this at this time. Yes, and thank goodness for vocal role models like yourself. You're often described as the first African-American transgender person in the U.S. And I, I'm interested to hear your personal story of growing up as an androgynous child and the challenges that you face, as well as some of the benefits uh, in terms of, you know, growing up as a musician. For example, I hear the combination of masculinity and femininity has given you access to a vocal style that you know, very few people possess. So could you share your personal story with us? Sure, sure. Well, I came to terms with who I really was in college. It was always there. And the reason why I use the term androgyny to how I grew up is just simply because most people, when they saw me, didn't really know or what to call me during this, during my teenage period. Nine times out of 10 or seven times out of 10, it would be hi, ma'am, you know, or whatever, just because I never had, um, I don't know. I just was a very feminine child. I guess that's the way to put it. And so, and knowing that, understanding that now as an adult, some of the privileges of it was that. I didn't receive as much of the bullying and the violence of other people, but I still was bullied. I still was sexually assaulted. I still went through some of the same things that other people did as well, because anytime someone is, is different, um, and I, in, in, in all society, those are the ones that people want to pick on the most, right? So even if I wasn't getting beat up by other boys, it would be girls pulling my hair or, you know, calling me names or being jealous because I just whooped their tail in double dutch or something like that, you know? Um, so it was, it, it was a challenging time. I was just very fortunate because I had a mother who, although we came from a very religious family and she was a youth evangelist in the Kojic church, you guys are going to read about that and some of my experiences in my memoir, um, I'm amazed that she was able to choose love and she just never denied who I was. And she wanted me to grow and have a good self-esteem. And so did the aunts and my grandparents, you know, in my family um, that were positive about it. There were others that were not. Um, and so therefore my mom kind of sheltered me and so I really didn't start going out into the world and doing anything but playing violin until I was probably 18, 19, somewhere around there. And then I started going to different bars and clubs and seeing that there were more people that were like myself. Uh, but in the classical music world, I would go and do what I had to do and I didn't see people like myself. So there was always this craving of, why can't I just work and be around people like me? And so I had a period of time where I started going into the club world, just, just wanting to go and dance. I usually would dance by myself, would go out and have a fun time. I found the best places to go and party were around the, what my mom called the children were LGBTQ spaces, you know, people just wanted to have a good time. There wasn't, um, a lot of violence and that sort of thing. So I went through that period of time and I realized that this is who I am. Um, I changed my name after letting my family know where they already knew, you know, but, you know, letting them know this is officially who I am. I've done the research and this is what I want to do. And um, that was around 22, somewhere around there. 
and I went to college and I started transitioning slowly in college. And my professors were all surprised and, and awesome about it, but they were just like, oh, okay, okay, this is what's happening. Um, but again, as I said, with auditions, people trying to understand where would you do, what, you know, all that kind of stuff started to come up. And I just kept trying to tell people, don't look at the outside, listen from within. You know, what do you hear? Where do you think that I can be of service? What does this have to do with anything when it comes down to playing the broken violin concerto or whatever it is? My job is to get here and play. You see what I'm saying? And, you know, when you're in college, it's it's a bubble, right? So while you're advocating for yourself, and I'm so proud of young people these days because they're doing a lot of it, you know, you can make change relatively quickly. People can see how you're leading your life and and things will change rapidly. And so even on campus, they started getting more open and affirming. I went to a private Methodist school, Shenandoah University and Conservatory of Music, um, but they became super open. I sang in the gospel choir, was always in the alto section of the gospel choir. I was playing in three different orchestras. And I just let myself be myself. And um, I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. And, and I think that we're going to see over the next 10, 15 years that more and more people and young people are just going to be able to live their lives. And, and that's great. That is. That's so great to hear. I mean, it sounds as though, um, you know, it's great to hear that your family and your campus and your, your tutors uh, were really supportive of you, you know, um, during and after your transition. Is, is there anything you would do differently now, knowing what you know now? No. Mm -mm. No, I have very little regrets in life. I think it's be simply because I can live in my truth and do what I love to do. And so that brings me great joy. And I also think very clearly about what my goals are. I say more no's to things than I say yeses, which is probably why I'm not as famous as, as some others. I just refuse to do certain things, uh, you know, that the industry may want you to do or what have you. I feel that I have a talent and, and that talent should speak for itself and my work should speak for itself and I shouldn't have to be naked on a, on a project or something crazy that has nothing to do with the work that I'm here to do. And of course, as a teacher, I teach students of all ages. So I'm also a role model for these young girls. And I don't want to be just put out there any kind of way. Now with my book, and hopefully if that becomes a movie one day, um, I had to also be real about things that really did happen that weren't so great in my life. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the assaults and different things. And I had to realize that that's just a part of your life. You just have to be truthful and honest about it. It's a very real and raw account of, of my life. Wow. I look forward to reading it. Um, what are some of the challenges of being a transgender black woman right now in the U.S.? And what are some of your biggest concerns? The biggest, well, we have challenges on every level, socioeconomic, you know, housing discrimination, um, employment discrimination. It's getting a lot better. More of my sisters are able to actually work, have jobs, getting your name changed and all of your, your gender marker changes. Uh, because depending on what state you're in, it can be more challenging than in another state as you guys can see from our politics with Ron DeSantis and Florida and some of these people who just, you know, they want to, they're getting to the point where they want to actually follow parents and kids to know where they're going if they're transitioning and penalize the parents. So there's just all kinds of craziness in some of these states that are happening that we're all advocating and, um, you know, trying to resist, you know, so a, lo a lot of the big advocates and a lot of the activists are saying, look, this is very, 
very harmful. And it's taking us back. It's regressing us back to before people had these freedoms. And we're starting to see this movement around the world where we're seeing these political parties try to do this. So it is it is not an easy life. Um, the other bigger problem that I, I, I worry about is that if we don't do this for the young people, what is their life going to be? If we don't get out here and change these things, advocate. You know, there's a big problem in relationships in this country to find people who will respect you as a gender non-conforming person or as a transgender person or non-binary to respect you as a human being. That is a huge problem because everyone is trying to date you, but they don't want the world to know about it. So that is a huge problem. So we, we it's multifaceted. It's not going to change tomorrow. But we're seeing signs that the general public as a whole, what's the majority, is not the stuff that these politicians are trying to get past. That's absolutely correct. And that's exactly what we're we're finding. The majority do not think that way. Um, what advice, you know, given all these challenges, and, and as you sa said that you're particularly concerned for, you know, younger trans people, um, what advice do you have for these younger people of color who are in the process of transitioning or struggling, um, you know, whether to transition or not? Well, you have to find your family. Family is not always blood related. Family oftentimes for us as LGBTQ people will be your friends. It will be associates. It'll be someone that you would have never thought would be in your corner that will be there for you. And so if you're a young person, newly transitioning of color, you know that you come from a very transphobic or homophobic um, family, you have to get away from that toxic group. And that's very hard to do. I, I know I say it very flippantly, but for me, it wasn't as hard because I had the passion of music. And so it was not hard for me to get away from people who were toxic. But for others, they can't just get away. So you have to find that group of people that support you and your transition, that love you for who you are, that are going to say your name and call you by the gender that is affirming to you. you don't stay in situations with people that are going to be disrespectful to you all the time, because that's what causes most of the psychological harm that we're studying and that we're seeing. Um, there are some wonderful surveys that are out now uh, and they're just saying, the, stating the obvious. Students, people who are allowed to be themselves when um, they're finding that if a young person who is getting affirming care is simply just allowing them to um, use the pronouns that they want you to use. That's the beginning of the affirming care that, of course, has been mis misinformation about and all that. So it's imperative for them to find that small circle of people that is going to be respectful to their identity, that is going to support them and, in, and their endeavors, and to get away from those that are not. Everyone is not going to get it. Everyone is not going to like you. You know, I tell people that all the time and the whole everyone starts laughing in the audience, but it is it's the truth. Some people are just not going to get you, not going to understand. It could be people in your family. It could be some of your friends or what have you, but you have to look within. And the last thing I was going to say was that for me, that's what music did. I started off as a dancer and my body was changing and I wanted to go to the Royal Ballet and all this stuff. But, you know, I kept my weight kept fluctuating and different things. So I knew that that was not going to be an option. I wasn't tall enough, all those things. And I got into music and it was the one thing where I could zone out and focus on it and feel this wonderful energy all the time, a non-judgmental energy. You know, and I could, no matter what my situation was, I would go to my music. So another thing that they could do is to find a hobby, an interest, um, where they can be in a supportive environment like the arts, 
um, and they can feel like they can live in their authentic truth. That, that's such great advice. How do you encourage transgender people to follow their dreams like you did? Yeah, well, the first thing you have to do, and this is why I say counseling is so important for all of us, anyone who is different, because you're not necessarily the problem. It's the way the world views you and what comes towards you that becomes the problem, right? So one of the issues that I noticed that other transgender people have is focusing on what everyone else thinks and does. Like you you can't do that Not as a transgender person. I mean, when I was like a kid, I used to walk through the hallways with my book all the way up here and just walk through the hallways. I didn't want to be bothered with everybody else and all the craziness and all that. I would just go to my classes and my book would be up here. And that's kind of like how I've lived my whole life. It's a bubble or there's a circle and that's my goal. You know, I don't have time to worry about, okay, what are people going to say about what your voice sounds like? What are people going to say about, you know, your garment or your appearance or any of those things? My job is to go in there and do it to the best of my ability. The director, conductor, whoever either likes it or they don't. That's just it. And the same thing for young people. Stay focused and and never feel that you can't do anything. If my career and any of the other great artists that are going to be coming out um, more and more um, can tell you is that none of us thought we would be where we were going to be because of all the obstacles. But as long as you just keep doing the same thing over and over, you're going to be better at it. You're going to learn from it. And as long as you don't let those negative thoughts in your head tell you that you can't do something, that you're not worthy, that, you know, whatever's going on in politics is going to keep you from, you have to ignore all those things and you have to just keep doing and keep focusing, keep your eye on the prize. No one can stop you when you do that. I 100% I agree with you, and it's great advice. Again, um, in your opinion, do you think the art world is perhaps more welcoming to the trans community and LGBTQ plus community in general than, say, other professions or industries? That is such a great question. It depends on what part of the art world you're in. And I can't say that it's, I used to think that it was more open than other art forms. I would say for LGB people, but trans people, not so much. I mean, if you look at it, I also sang in a production where I was the first trans woman to play a trans character. And we're, look, look how long it's taken to do that. So I feel that trans people, we still have it a little more, a little more difficult um, because people just haven't seen it. You know, it's just like anything else in life. The more representation people see, the more it clicks to them that it's even possible. I could not and have not ever been able to have a manager or anything like that, uh, marketing person, all those things, because people kept saying, we don't even know how to market you. We've never seen anyone like you be successful. Yeah. You know, your other issue that you're going to have in, even in the arts is, is simple because everyone goes through it is funding, but how often are major corporations going to fund a transgender event? They might even fund the LGB community, but a transgender event, it's very hard to get funding right now um, for it. And I know personally, because my Carnegie Hall debut, um, we had to pay for it ourselves. We didn't get any corporate sponsors whatsoever, all the pride organizations. I mean, I went knocking on doors and everything to all of these supposed organizations that are supposed to help all the LGBTQ community. And because I am black and trans, we got no money. Now, what they would do is they would promote it on their websites and stuff like that. But there was no financial assistance. If it wasn't for the fact that there was an author who has a book about trans women that he wrote, 
this man, um, he helped me with the down payment and we did a GoFundMe campaign to raise a little bit of money just so that we could pay it because we didn't, we couldn't get any help. And that's a, a huge issue, you know, and, and that's one that may deter a lot of people uh, in the beginning that you are going to have to pay for things yourself normally and where you're not going to get paid as much as some other people, especially if you're a trans person of color. So you have to figure out a way to do it. And, you know, you have to be resourceful and you have to not be delusional about it. If you're not delusional about it, yes, it might hurt. Yes, you may be upset for a little bit, but you realize, okay, I have to find another way to get something done. What do you think the arts and media world can do differently to be, you know, more inclusive to the trans community and provide this much needed funding? Um, the arts world needs to do everything differently. The arts world has excluded us for so many years. Um, so they, the first start is to fund our events would be great. You know, um, when we send you proposals and all that kind of stuff, that'd be wonderful. Um, and to allow space. Where is the space for transgender performers? I mean, even Pride, you would think that many of these opera companies and orchestras and whatnot would have a Pride festival or something. So even if just once a year, I could come and play the Lalo Symphony Espanol or something or a movement of something on that kind of show. I mean, that's a very small thing. It would be one night out of the entire year. That would be extremely um, successful, especially since trans celebrities are starting to get bigger and bigger and bigger and can fill a house. And these orchestra companies are struggling to keep people in the seat. You would think they would get that we need to diversify. People need to see reflections of themselves um, on the stage. So we're starting to see that slowly but surely in America, but not as much. Also, as far as the opera companies, um, programming works that have transgender characters, which means that composers need to be given funding so that they can create these things. And as far as the composers are are concerned, making sure that you actually develop the role using a real transgender person. I cannot believe that I have to say this, but that has been my thing going around to these colleges and universities and saying, you can't sit there and think that every transgender mezzo is is a lyric a light lyric mezzo. So you take a cisgender woman and you um, um develop the role around her voice, but then if you ask me to come and sing it, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is not comfortable. It it may be a tessitura issue. It might just be the color of my sound and voice. I have a bigger voice, so a lot of those roles that are coming out now want you to be on stage for like an hour and a half the entire time. Just stuff that would ruin, ruin, excuse me, transgender voices. So that's another reason why I've become such an advocate for sitting down with composers, singing through art songs, doing this type of stuff so that they can see um, if you want to have a transgender character, you want this to be successful, you want a transgender person to sing it. Um, we need more um, composers of color as well that will make roles for transgender people of color. So we have a long way to go, but it all starts with funding. If there's no funding for it, if I start a nonprofit organization, which I'm going to call Music Saves Lives, and this is a part of it, we need to be able to go and get funding so that we can pay people. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not rocket science, but that is the reason why you don't see it. Well, it's great to hear that you've got some um, amazing projects under your belt. Talking of current projects, um, you've mentioned earlier that you're writing a memoir, and I'm really excited to hear a little bit more about that. Well, this memoir, um, as we were talking about earlier, is my attempt to explain what it was like to grow up in the South as a Black transgender woman from early on all the way through my career. And also to speak specifically about the challenges that came along, even though on the public forefront, they just saw, oh, you're performing for a president. Oh, you're at Carnegie Hall. 
oh, you're doing these things. But people didn't know the behind the scenes. And so I thought that that was imperative as well. And and certain things that I never talked about, as, as I said, you know, about love, relationships, sex, all of those type of things, um, my actual transition, what decisions I made um, in that regard, um, and just everything you can imagine is in this book. And I'm so proud of it because it wasn't just me. It was actually an idea by one of my friends who's a journalist. His name is Christopher Keene. And so that I could still tour, perform, and do different things, he would ask me all of these interview questions. And so the book is it's so different than most things. They're interviews that we transcribed over the years. And we're talking like 50 hours of like interviews. So we transcribed them. And then I have another diva who came onto the project and her name is Megan Sheehy. And we went to high school together and she's a professor up in uh, at Hartwood College. And she helped us to put um, things in chapters and to also um, make it educational. So there's a lot of colleges that would like this book because we have all kinds of annotations and survey information. Every every chapter has a quote from someone else and something that's going on um, to explain why some of the things that happened in my life happened based off of actual data. So I'm so proud of her. I would have never thought of doing that if it wasn't for her. I also have a transgender man of color who is the graphic designer for the book. So he did a fantastic job. This was a community project. One of my exes um, actually did the photography. So all of that, this is a community project of all of them volunteering to help me to get this off the ground. Um, and so I'm so proud of it. Is it published? If not, when will it be published? So we just finished it and we're going to just pop it on Amazon sometime in June. So, so you guys will be able to pick it up on Amazon because I want it to be a global thing. Um, I've talked to so many colleges and universities that want me to come in book, book festivals, want me to come and speak about it. And they want their students to read it, especially if there's gender studies, um, really big sociology um, departments, um, uh, which is what I did up there at the New, New, um, University of New Hampshire. They would like me to come back and want to buy the books and make it a required reading. I think psych psychological, like psychology departments are going to be interested. But now that we have gender and women's studies as a degree, I'm really hoping that a lot of them say, you know what, we, we need to share this experience of womanhood and femininity. Uh, and so far, so good. So far, so good. Well, it's definitely going to be on my reading list this summer. <laughs> now, we're also excited that you're going to be giving a keynote uh, at my G-Works Global Virtual Five-Day uh, Work Pride Conference, which is themed Working with Pride. Can you share why Working with Pride uh, matters to you and what it means to you? It is everything. You cannot achieve greatness if you're in a toxic working environment. If you have negative thoughts in your mind and head about what is possible. So I am so pleased that G-Works is doing the work that you guys are doing because people need to understand how fierce we are, not just the way we look or fashion or some of the things that may be seen cliche about our community, but just how intelligent and brilliant we are. And so I, I'm really looking forward to encouraging more companies to hire LGBTQ people. Have us come and speak. I do this all the time, corporate events where I just speak about my life, similar to what we're doing today, and, and get a question and answer so that the, the employees can ask me the questions that they really want to know. Because that's important too, because of course, no one wants to offend someone else or whatever. But by having these conversations, you learn how to have them properly. And once you have the proper conversations and you're able to ask, and we know that it's not coming 
from any ill intent, then we can get down to some of the issues you may be having as to why your company doesn't have too many out LGBTQ people there. Because believe me, whether they're out or not, we're we're everywhere. Whether we tell you our personal business, some of us that are brave enough and courageous enough to do that on an international level, you don't have to be that person to make a difference. And no one, no one knows everyone that's LGBTQ. You'll never know that. That's right. And working with pride should matter to us all, regardless of who we are. Finally, how can our members find out more about you? How can they get in touch if they wanted to? Sure. So I am on most of the social media platforms as at T-O-N-A-C-I-T-Y, Tenacity, um, which is the name of my book, mind you, because that was my nickname growing up was Tenacity. So, um, and then I shortened my nickname to Tona and that's how I came with my name. So that's a very interesting story, but yeah, follow me on Instagram, um, at the same handle. Also, my company is called Aida Studios. That's on Instagram and Facebook. Just look up Tona Brown with the blue check and you'll see me there and you'll see all the work that I do. I'm constantly posting and I'm also posting things by other fantastic journalists and friends who are out here advocating and fighting for equal rights for all. So if, you, if you're if you interested in that sort of thing, then you'll like my feed. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today at My Do You Work. And we're so looking forward to seeing you at Work Pride.